Soul Food Poetry Night. We are in a giant hall. This is like uh, a big stadium, right? Because of the echo. Uh, we'll we'll work work on uh, eliminating the echo. Uh, I'm Michael Dillon Welch, your friendly curator, and I'm pleased to curate this reading series with our new co-curator, Tanya McDonald. Yay, Tanya! Thank you. Um, we have two great readers tonight, and after a break, at which time. You can buy things, including some books on the table here. Um, we'll have the open mic, and uh, the open mic sign-up is down here, and the question this month is your favorite childhood toy. So please make a note of that when you sign up. I'd like to begin by reading a poem by Billy Collins. Introduction to Poetry. I ask them to take a poem and hold it up to the light like a color slide or press an ear against its hive. I say, drop a mouse into, the, into a poem and watch him probe his way out or walk inside the poem's room and feel the walls for a light switch. I want them to water ski across the surface of, the, of a poem waving at the author's name on the shore. But all they want to do is tie the poem to a chair with a rope and torture a confession out of it. They begin beating it with a hose to find out what it really means. Our two readers tonight are Dana Lynn and Connie Wally. And these are the, this is the official bios of each, each of them. Jane is a poet, essayist, and fine art photographer. She was born in Portland, Oregon, and currently lives in Anacortes. So thank you for making the trip today. Necessity of Flight is available down here, published in 2011 by Cherry Grove, with her first full-length collection of poems. Previously, uh, a chapbook, Threads and Dust, was published by Finishing Line Press in 2005. She received a William Stafford Award from the Washington Poets Association, and her poems have appeared in numerous journals such as Calix, Floating Bridge Review, The Pacific Review, Kirkus Review, Mannerborn, Snowy Egret, Stringtown, and Twitched On Gutenberg, as well as in many anthologies. And I'm always pleased to see such uh, wide publication credits because uh, it, um, I, it, makes me it helps me discover new journals. Um, I want to check them out. And uh, also a bit about Connie Wally. She resides in Tacoma and is president and founder of Puget Sound Poetry Connection, where she hosts the monthly Distinguished Writer Series. And if you've never had a chance to check that out, please go and, and do it, because some of the writers are excellent. Uh, there's a website uh, for that, so you can, uh, you can Bing it if you're a Microsofty, or Google it if you're not. Yeah, but I'm, yeah, yeah, good idea. <laughs> Connie also founded Our Own Words, a teen writing contest. She's a mother of three, grandmother of seven, and currently retired. Her poetry recently appeared in Pontoon, published by Floating Bridge Press. So please, uh, to start us off, please welcome Jane Alin. Michael, and thanks everyone for coming this evening. Oops. Michael, you're taller than I am. I'm going to open with my soul food poem. It happens to be the first poem in my new volume, Small Gods. Sitting outdoors in the neighborhood cafe, pen in hand, I scratch on paper like a bird in winter, 
trying to scrape up something to feed that dire hunger. The haunting emptiness from being unable to find words for so long now. The mind a mere immensity of nothing. And breath shallow as the dying. Then from the gutter a sparrow drops to my feet, puffed up, beak going, cheep, cheep cheeping loudly for crumbs, a small fit welled up from emptiness. Something settled with this divine adaptive song, and for a little while at least, she renews my faith in a life of radiant poverty. you, um, I, haven't, I don't know a lot of you, but those of you that are here may not know that I'm, I was also a psychologist in my past life, one of my many lives, counseling psychologist actually, I don't want to misrepresent myself. So this poem is inspired by that life, it's called Freud's Rug. Once, and um, by the way, this poem is all one sentence, <laughs> so it's a long one. Grammatically, it was very difficult. Freud's Rug. Once I dreamed of meeting with Dr. Sigmund Freud in his Vienna office, where neurotic patients with father issues would come and pay the agreed-upon fee to lie on his couch, a dream bed draped with centuries-old Kashkai rug several times a week to say whatever comes to mind from their inner lives, stuff gathered like dust in that nomadic tribal rug, its ancient pattern a fitting landscape for sinking into reverie, dreams and repressed memories that work into the warp and weft of one's life, the weave of relationships their complex motifs with knotted ends, free associating 45 minutes to an hour over years, unraveling like a bolt of yarn in a sinuous unlocking of lips, which first open when I began analysis and look deeper into the chiral, fixating on its madder red field and Rorschach shape animals and birds so deranged they couldn't be the simplest things. And suddenly, I'm back in my office, seeing the same pattern on my mouse pad, a brilliant manifestation of someone else's dream, someone whose steady beam of desire enabled her to step out boldly without years of brooding and turn flight of fancy into wish fulfillment, making that famous Kashkai rug a gainful venture and enviable sublimation. In a recent issue, I, I used when I was I read this before. I said the last issue, but a recent issue of um, now I want to say the New Yorker. That's the Harper's, but anyway, uh, Donald Hall had a wonderful um, little essay called "Out My Window," and it was about aging. And so this poem is a little short poem that <coughs> is what I see out my window. Considering the Ragosa Rose. The Ragosa is no one's. It grows rampant, rearing up among broken weeds. I love its shaggy, unkempt habit, the thrust, thrust of the eager runners, which know no season. Wrinkled leaves, little pink flowers, the color of nakedness, the scent of coming and going. In winter, Rubenesque hips, the purity of its boughs, 
quickly? Yes, this bramble's merciless, but I don't mind the thorns. They awaken me to my own longings. Up in the Skagit Valley, from where I live, the Skagit Valley where I live. In the wintertime we have, um, you know, it's a wintering over place for many wonderful birds. We have here, we have snow owls, I mean snow, um, snow geese and trumpeter swans, which um, long ago they were almost extinct because the hunters would shoot them and, and leave lead shot around and the birds would come and and they die eating the lead shot because they pick it out of the fields. Um, but they've they've had a comeback. So um, so this poem is called "In Want of Wings." The trumpeter swans are standing in the field alongside the road, white, outsized, magnificent. Suddenly agitated by something, these birds take off running their bodies remembering the risk to living in the open. The mass, as it moves for flight, stops all song. The swans face the wind with wide stretched wings, arcs of luminosity, lifting their heavy bodies skyward. Filled with awe, I watch them until I am looking only at the distance. And I think of things that make us disappear, what harm the fowlers do. When I have wanted wings, a child launched into darkness dreams of human flight not forbidden, being born swiftly on a rush of wind, those miraculous pinions in perfect rhythm of progression, blood feeding feathers, wings pumping, breastbone, heaving, freezing, easier than to come to a sweet end, having brought herself from the brink of extinction. Well, speaking of flight, um, <laughs> I've had many careers. Um, my very first career was as a ballet dancer, and uh <laughs> Just a, uh, just a little note about as for an introduction. In, in 1795, um, French dancer and choreographer Charles Didelot developed a flying machine, and it lifted the dancers up on their toes. So it inspired these couches, these, these things the dancers wear today. And also choreographers, um, they love the lightness, the the you know, sort of that ethereal quality of, of the dancer and what these, these couches do. So this poem is called, What I Know About the Ballet. You hold pose after pose with murderous formality, an airy figure on point, looking weightless, unburdened, but really the body is a boulder and you think like Sisyphus, you're forever doomed to this uphill battle against the big stick of gravity. Even the delicate skeleton you become means nothing to those lifts and grand leaps. And that fixed ballet style, it gives no hint of the tantrum of muscles, the mesh of blisters on your feet, broken open for your bloodied toes, crammed in those satin boxes, grow hot and stain your shoes red. At the end, having bent yourself into a plummeting swan, lost to the lake of tears, you're drenched, a burnished, breathless wreck. Your mother applauds. 
it's hard to explain this love of a lunatic art, this torture laced with grace. I just came off of a not very long but sort of an extended fast and uh, so I've had hunger on my mind a lot today and so I'm going to read a couple of food poems to you (laughs) (coughs) Hummingbird she remembers how he entered the flower keen on the honeysuckle that fluttered itself enamored of red his brazen body hovering darting in and out, interrupted now and then by the humming of a nectar seeker's rival, equally as beautiful. Then, with the flush of spring, he turns a coppery back to her, ascends slowly to great heights, and dives on whistling wings in a giddy twist toward her, tail on fire. She'd like to get used to this. But such displays are short-lived. Given to being alone, never alighting, or not for long. Ever a flitterer, he buzzes off to the next flower, as she knew he would, leaving her the nest and a hunger greater than her tiny body let down. Chicken feet. By noon Sunday, King's Chinese cuisine is already full of open-faced Chinese with chopsticks animating their hands. We've come a long way for dim sum, half blanched by hunger. At that, a young Chinese couple with centuries of Taoism sealed in their marrow make room for us at their table. As if we're unexpected but welcome guests, they gather dish after dish with a fund of exuberance until the table is a vision of an altar, round shrine of plenty. The wraps, the folds of wonton, steaming yet unbroken, the red of hot dipping sauce, the yellow of yam samosa, the light shrimp balls, orange and spiked like a punk's head of hair, chilled jellyfish alongside the thin skin of white and gleaming shark skin dumplings swimming in a sea of bread, pleated pot stickers, the smile-shaped wedges of vegetables in a see-through wrap, and chicken feet, deep-fried, stewed, then stacked like lard, old scrolls, relics of flesh and tendon and bone, their ghostly pieces a delicate gelatinous mess. But it seems there is no delicacy that doesn't have weight. For me, it's the chicken feet, the unsavoriness of toes. For the man whose name is Franco, it tips, it's tipped by so much he wants to tell us. What whim brought him here, his longing? Like a grain of rice, a bit of truth rolls off his tongue. Canada is a lark, he says. Here, I'm carefree, blithe spirit, only sampling life like dim sum. At home, in China, I'd settle my regrets and I'd make something of myself. As he devours the last foot and spits small bones on a plate, licks clean his fingers, I think chicken feet must complete some hunger, the fullness people feel when they've taken to the air, to what's numbing, light, a blast of life without substance, 
and come to know they want to eat. Okay. Michael asked me to read why I want to work at Slow Food, so I'm going to do this instead of my next choice. Um, this poem, uh, we lived in Madison for a while and, and became very good friends with uh, John DeGlorio, who's the um, proprietor of Slow Food in Madison. And uh, there was a time that I said, hey, John, I'd like to work here. And he said, okay, write a 500-word essay. And... Um, and that'll be your application. And Well, I didn't write the essay, but I did write a poem. And I didn't work there either, but I did write the poem. Why I Want to Work at Slow Food, an application for a job in Edison, Washington. To be in the lyric world of the slew, a minute universe strangely dense with life, where the slate blue kingfisher, that busy, chatty fellow, who flashes cobalt at dawn is too busy fishing to comb his hair. And to linger in this town where little seems to happen but turns to a landscape of plenty and ideal light, immersed in the bright wallow of crop work, its channeling of European charm and good taste, hungering like so many for something palpable. Here I could attend to what is. Tins of truffles and tapenade, sauces for the flight of appetites, bottles of pomegranate molasses, local honey and olive oil the color of pollen, fresh mozzarella, French chocolate low, dark as an unguarded moment, and wine, thriving racks of it. Those providential displays in a space so small it might be a still life, warm and ambient as broth stew, apples, and wine. As constant as water itself, people gather here in narrow aisles, always rhapsodic, lifting their glasses to the spirit, the first-rate cellar, prosciutto and chevre spread on a baguette, transfixed listening to French radio, while they sip wine, slow to decide how to extend life's pleasures, never minding the screech of the hinge as the door opens and closes, flapping like that kingfisher in the labyrinth of, labyrinth of abundance. Uh, how am I doing? Come on. I forgot to notice. I'll read one um, new poem. Uh, one new poem. This is actually part of a series that um, I was lucky to be invited to um, exhibit my poems with a, an artist up in Anacortes. And so these poems actually were in a gallery. And this it, the show was called Wetland Abstractions. So this is called The Green Place. This is where I go when the rain stops. I walk next to the stream, a boggy, narrow corridor of seamless rock, verdant with moss. Through ancient evergreens and arches of broadleaf trees that enshrine me, I grieve for the dwindling wetlands, the salmon, who need, like me, cool, hidden places quiet water edges to recover themselves. Humankind has not helped them. I want to believe that someday, caring as never before, we'll see the whole of it. And I'll close. I, I often close with this. Um, it's... Um, this was an experience. My husband and I decided um, we wanted to try out the snowbird life because we get really cold here in the wintertime. <laughs> so um, this was written after our 
I think about two years ago, called Snowbird. Because winter claims more than a season from us, we decided as we watched the geese depart to be like them, which meant migrating as they must do every winter along flyways to regions in the south where they find relief from the cold. But the whole way we were lashed by storms, split by the chill, blinded by the smear of rain and snow and snow in Tucson, Silver City, Santa Fe, even Death ba Valley, <laughs> even Death Valley turned us back, river black spilling over the flooded gutter of land, roads closed, rain still falling. Day after day, we woke to cold damp, water pooled in craggy campgrounds, the few still open. It's a record season, we read, for precipitation, the worst weather in 140 recorded years. We cursed the news and abandoned our journey. How different it would have been if our bones were light enough, if we had sufficient stamina for trouble wings to lift us above the surfaces of the earth if we had known how to take advantage of the wind. Thank you very much. It's uh, customary at uh, Soul Food uh, for one reader to choose the other reader. And I was wondering if you might say a word or two about uh, choosing uh, Connie to read with you. Um, yes. How I got lost in the snow. Well, <laughs> I actually love Connie dearly. <laughs> I just read at her uh, reading down in last month, and but let's see. I was supposed to read here in January, and we got snowed out, right? And so I needed to pick another reader. And I was, the first person that came to my mind was Connie. So, Connie, welcome. Well, first of all, thank you, Jane, for inviting me and Michael, too. This is, a, this is a treat for me. I run a venue in Tacoma, and very don't always get to read um, myself. So I try to uh, end the evening with a poem, but that doesn't always happen when you have 20-some readers. My first poem is from my little chapbook called Go to Sleep, My Children. My next-door neighbor is Cambodian, and one day I said to her, how in the hell did you get to beautiful downtown Tacoma from Cambodia? And she said, well, after my husband was killed in a killing field, and I went, say what? <laughs> so I got a pen and paper out. We inter I interviewed her for several months. I studied the Khmer War, War longer than I really wanted to and came up with this. So, and I tried to tell it in her, her words. It's called How It All Began, The Killing Field. He lies in foul mud. Another's blood drips off his nose and between his legs. He dares not brush off mosquitoes, scratch, or take a deep breath. Silence seeps in. All that is left is acrid smell of rotting flesh. No bullets, no voices. He slips out of the pit into deep crashes, lies quietly, waits for sounds or movement, runs to the jungle for home, moves into the house, places his hand over his wife's mouth to silence her cry of joy then helps her dig a pit to hide him covered with a carpet. The next night, he again is on the run. His wife tells a neighbor, and the news echoes like marbles in a cairn. In panic and fear, baskets were filled with food, children tied to backs, and he began the long, hard trail to freedom. Not your usual Sunday walk. Two pairs of pants, two shirts, one skirt, and a blanket. A two-year-old son lifted onto my shoulder, a three-month-old son tied to my hip. My husband murdered, I flee to Thailand from Cambodia. 
With neighbors, relatives, friends, we travel a narrow path through the jungle. I have no food, no money. The others share food with me, but I feed only my children. Sam Cook gives me food and says, for you, eat. Your children need you. A man steps off the trail to urinate, steps on a landmine, and is blown away. Women are dragged off the trail by bandits, raped, their clothes stolen for gold, sewed into the seams. Three days, three nights, she sleep in short two-hour sets. Finally, we reach a small village filled with shanty towns and branches and leaves. The Red Cross runs red. This is but one segment of my three-year journey to freedom, for soon soldiers will come and I will again run with my children under the hail of bullets. Sam Cook, uh, her brother and sister were both, uh, and his wife were killed, and Sam Cook was her brother's mother-in-law and caught up with her on this trail and was a real godsend to her to, to help her with the children. Uh, Sam Cook would often go out in the woods and forage um, for food, and that was where all the landmines were, so that was a good thing to see. Bamboo baskets. I, play I pay 20 baht for water I will sell back at the camp. The rope slides over pulley as the bucket lowers into the well, and I hear screams, and then a tat tat tat, and I freeze, my baby. I run into hordes of people running towards me, and Sam Cook stops me and says, no, go with us. I cry, my babies, my babies, and Sam Cook points to the baskets heavy enough on the ends of bamboo poles. Your babies are safe. Each basket holds food, a blanket, and a shawl. The children lie very still. Five hours we race through the jungle with our heavy burden. Five hours without rest. Finally, we come to a Thai temple where there's quiet and shelter. Here I cradle my babies and rock them and whisper very quickly in prayer. Study in the war. This was uh, something that happened uh, way too often. It's called Hunter and Hunted. He hangs his prey from the tree with his shiny new blade, slits the belly open, carefully removes the iron-rich liver. He places it in a pan and hands it to a chef, smiles at his fine catch this magic meal, which will make him strong and full of courage, walks away as the blood drips from his steaming mouth, drop by drop. refugee camp. Two years on a 10 by 10 tarp, I feed the children to the temple. Under a thatched roof with no walls, I grow self-fed. No privacy, wait for the war to end, I buy water, sell water. Days chain linked together, I put the children to bed. While the children sleep, tears wash away, I grow self-fed. The days, the nights, the months. I feed the children, go to temple. Heat corrodes my tenacity. I buy water, sell water. Night pushes me to the ground. I put the children to bed. Sits heavy on my neck until the light. I feed the children, go to temple. Pulls me and I keep on for God. Well, that was about two years ago, and I thought I was through with it. So uh, in December... This poem just popped up. Third son. The third son works at McDonald's, studies hard for college, worships at church three nights a week, and prays often for what no one knows. No memories of his mother back, the miles of walking off the dark night, the mounds of mass graves, the windows, the eyes of skulls. No memories of missing fish, rice, or milk. No whispering of bullets in his ear like an invisible breath the blessing of being born an American child. He does not want to be different than his friends, nor hold violence in his lunchbox. He has never carried Cambodia on his chin. Okay, we're still in a miserable train, but different subject. <coughs> not everyone. Everyone has a spot where they feel comfortable and safe. Tom Adams. Not in my bedroom, where I'm what I touch, found its way into sheets. Not in the kitchen where hand-colored sheets and printed quilted awnings. Not in the bathroom where drowning is threatened every minute. 
got under the apple tree in the backyard where bark and printed mill died. Not at school where harsh words cut deeper than knives. Not in the haze of colored bottles or dirty needles. Not even in the quiet of those cold days. A look is the fire itself. Smoke fills the living room of the house to share only shadows. She stands patiently in the center, sees fire, licks the tips of her shoes, jumps to her skirt. She raises arms above her head. It climbs her arms, leaps to her hair. Then the fire department arrives. All they find are ashes and ghosts fleeing through the backyard. What no one told me about old age. You lose your favorite food, your knees, your hearing and sight replaced by pain or pills. Then you lose your friends one by one. Finally, your best friend leaves in her own personalized box. This isn't just a pensioner's life. This is your insides being pulled out and flung on the floor. This was the woman who celebrated your promotion, your son's wedding, and held you when you collapsed over a broken heart. This was the woman who insisted you go dancing even though you knew you needed to stay home that night or fed you when fun was short. This is the woman you should call at 3 a.m. and know she would listen to you. Now she is gone. You pick up the phone to call, place it back in the trailer, return, and cry. An inch shorter. Death takes a lot out of you, even when it's not your own. The arrangement, the calls, the sorting through memories, like water on a rock, you eventually wear thin. You're an inch shorter since your mother died, the doctor said, so I'm not surprised. Somehow I knew when she left to put the cross on my heart. Time changes everything. By the side of the old Highway 99, which has been replaced by a freeway three miles deep, a hundred-year-old building stood. The beige paint peels from the siding and creases are missing from the shingles on the steeple. The stained glass window has grown dark, a symbol of a kinder time, a do unto others kind of world. Now a sign adorns the length of the steeple. A local has started a new business. The sign reads, Gun Shop. That's a true story. Uh, Alfie at Fort Nisqually, 1847. Dear Mama, the mountains here are so beautiful, especially the one they call Mount Tacoma. I owe my mama a letter back at Boston. I miss the soft leather shoes, the cutty floors at the party. How can I tell her about here without making her worry? The rain keeps falling in this desolate, bright young country. Lettuce barely grown, corn not yet knee high, and it's August. Trees and squash have blossomed and died without producing. What will we do this winter? winter? Live on potatoes that grow any time, any place, even in this unrelenting rain? I don't have the money to buy flour unless Henry sells beaver pelts at a better price than last year, and I'm pregnant with my third child. Henry's a hard-working, good man, and he treats me well. He does love me. That should be enough. This is a poem I wrote quite a few years ago, but unfortunately I think it still f fits uh, today's world. It's called 57 Seconds. She torques, wipes, oils, polishes, washes, and drags. She circles her three times, touches her lovingly carefully backs her down her driveway. A letter comes a country has never heard of before, needs his undivided attention. It's been a long time, but if without tears, Mama folds this letter today. Okay, a little bit lighter. Love letters. Hot-blooded Indian boy, you so passionate letters filled with scenes of lovemaking, which in my nativity, I did not grasp, but Mama did, when she found your letter tucked away in my dresser with a prison return address. 
forbidden to write to you again, even to explain why no answer, and I didn't understand. But your memory hung over my shoulder like a shadow, full moon face, all is changed, shiny black hair slicked back, muscles bulging under that white t-shirt, eating your heart out, Marlon Brando. I've since forgotten the church retreat where we met and exchanged addresses, but your flashing eyes and warm smile remain with the letters bundled and piled in the bottom of my suitcase. This is our pretty son, Mary. For 50 years, she subjugated herself for him, placated her soul with violin lessons and poetry workshops. Then when she should be warm and comfortable with grandchildren and issues, he moved her to a cold, hard state away from friends and family. I weep for her. Or do I weep for myself, who is afraid of what all will love? Words are diamonds. I hand her words. They are like diamonds. Girl, car, yard, pet, asleep, right. I help her find them since they disappeared into park missing. I specify clock, time, make a sentence, I say. She moves her mouth, tries to form them, spitting them out. It's difficult to watch her struggle, open and close her mouth like a fish looking for a worm. Sentences search for the words first in the middle but are floating on an iceberg. I'm supposed to be her keeper of the words. What will I do when I've lost all of mine? Who will bring them back? area is good for worship. The towns are named after corporations, Indians, and women. Carnation, Colville, Marysville. A large boulder lies in the middle of the river, a big white strip all the way around, but too big for worship. Clouds like popcorn dot the mountains. Garage sales line the roadside now that the hay has been baled. Smoke can be seen in the distance. A wildfire, some lightning, or a warning that winter is hiding behind the clouds. Okay, this is the year of the dragon. And I was born in 1940. Yes, I'm older than Dirk. And uh, so that makes me a dragon. So here's my dragon here. Breath of fire, claws like knives, skin too tough to penetrate. Christians say this evil creature guards treasure it does not need. Chinese say the dragon is strength, wisdom, and goodness. I am a dragon. I am tough skin. I am strong and wise. And I sit on the pillar. Uh, the title of this one comes from a line from Joanne Henry Allward's uh, book, Heart. My virginity ached like a loose shoe. I could have been one of those girls. In high school, they were called easy. By graduation, they left school early to visit aunts in Minnesota. With my luck, I kept dating boys who wanted to protect my virginity. My hands wandered into places they didn't belong. My wrists were grabbed, and my hands placed in the folds of the skirts where they did belong. So when a man came along and paid me attention, well, that kind of attention, I married him. Then I found out he had this attitude that nice girls didn't do those things. Okay, I did it more than the three children I bore him, but it wasn't hot, fun, and tempestuous. It was never like in the movies, and I still yearn for the back seat of a Mustang. <laughs> and I'm going to finish up with this one. This is called For the Love of Sunday. Covered with a blanket of poetry books, I napped this Sunday afternoon, having read until I was depleted. What if I died like this? You go in my lap, feely at my breast, Jordan pressed against my hips. Would my children guess by the smile on my lips I died when I was out on the road? Thank you so much, uh, Connie and Jane. 
Uh, we'll take a, about a 10 minute break. Uh, please uh, uh, buy something uh, to eat or drink and take a look at uh, the books for sale that are on the table here and sign up for the open mic if you haven't yet done so. Again, thank you, Connie and Jane. We'll see you in 10 minutes.
Are we ready to get started again? The other day I was um, at home with my kids, which happens every day, um, fortunately. Um, and uh, my six-year-old daughter was explaining the Pledge of Allegiance to me um, and reciting it perfectly. And I started asking her, well, what does pledge mean? And what do some of the other words mean? And she knew quite a lot of them, but um, we ended up having some fun with it. And sort of together, this is a family poem. Um, and what I've done is, is taken the Pledge of Allegiance and I've added words in between um, that are sort of associated or sound like or fit with the, the words of the original. So I pledge allegiance becomes ice cream, pledge aerosol can, allegiance, and ladies, and so on. So here we go. The other pledge of allegiance. I scream, pledge aerosol can, allegiance, and ladies, two timer, the flag football of the United S United Night Teddy Bear, states of confusion of America boom. And Tootsie Roll, the Republicerish, for witches and goblins it stands a. Wonton soup nation, all evil, underwear, god fellows, indivisible, indivisible shit, with liberty bag and justice cream for all cahal. There you go. <laughs> and, and I couldn't think of a better one for indivisible shit, but there you go. I didn't tell them that one for the kids. <laughs> so we have um, uh, a nice set of readers tonight. Thank you for signing up. If you still need to sign up, um, you can still do that. We'll have the sign up down here. Um, please limit your reading to about three and a half to four minutes. Three and a half to four minutes. Thank you. And our first reader is Al Suarez, and a favorite childhood toy is uh, an anime robot called uh, a Gundam, which I'm not familiar with. Al Suarez. It actually is pronounced a Gundam, and actually uh, the funny thing is uh, I can monologue the moment for hours. It's a giant robot anime style thing. Too cheap. This thing I wrote like about a year ago, but I did not want to share because I just don't probably didn't want to share it, but now I'm going to share it because I just feel ballsy enough to share it. Yep. So please don't hurt me, Mom. It is always the mo is always most meaningful thing to wake up to the one you love. Their hair spread all over the pillow, like a glossy strings cut to a creeping style, to be tailored into an elegant blonde dress. Her hair smelled of pomegranates and the median hair covered part of the wire frame glasses. This is the woman I love. Her name is Maria. We have been known each other for about two years and it has been a full, no, it has been uh, two full years. Well, I'm going to just not read it. It's dyslexia. Um, but we have known each other for eight months also. I must move on, Maria, for the strings of fate are frayed and the bond that torn, the bond of us is torn with you is gone. I'm sorry, Maria. Hello. Up next, we have moving mic, Lindsay Baguette, whose favorite childhood toy is bears. You'll have to tell us what kind of bears. Hi, I, my name's Lindsay, and I like rabbits. <laughs> okay, so I have four poems, and it is entertainment. Bears, so I guess I'll go by Lindsay. Okay. 
grandpa just like keeps playing on the rocks that are things the rocks can do. They scream from sun till sundown. Grandpa, go down and count them. He does not speak. He soaks up the wick, picks up with the mug, continues his boiling of salt on his head. They tug harder at his hand, his fingers still dangly. No, really, we put up a fake. Okay, this one is about my great uncle. It's called Grandma Told Me This So Blame Her, 530-345-3899. When Daisy died of syphilis, she was engaged to Ted. Ted, the boy she grew up with, she never spared herself. After that, Ted never spoke to Brother Frank again. She took a razor in the back to cut down some whisper. Frank's mind was weak, his wills were numb, for he was nearly dead. He took a pistol to the park, shot it through his head. Usually that phone number is in here, but you don't have to call. All right, this one is called Something Slow is Going On. Some nights, Grandpa visits my bins to tell me what hell is going on. I was tied to a tree, and the forest animals were about to drink my blood when Grandpa came and started talking about how he had to climb a mountain of used cotton balls to reach me, and I'd better get ready. In hell, there are rooms full of things we don't like. There's a room with all the dogs that ever died, and a room for peanut butter on celery, and one room full of saxophone music. He's been looking for the bathroom for weeks, but whenever he nears the goal, a trap door opens, and he drops to a pit of sticky soap. Also, there's fire, but only in one hallway, so it's okay. I said, well, that sounds awful. Oh, and would you untie me from this tree? He just smiled at the bear by my shoulder and wandered back to bed. I don't know if he meant for me to cry. Dee Dee wants to climb the sand dunes, so he follows divers. Divers avoid him, but he wouldn't want that. He wants to be licking salt off rocks or snuffing the spritz that swim near his nose. Sometimes Dee Dee imagines non-floating creatures, such as squirrels and almonds, and he hums songs about them while perforating an octopus. If there is a submarine, he recalls his vocation and comes to chew on the corner. Shark experts remember Dee Dee as the responsible fish who ate half their family. When whale ghost comes, Dee Dee swims through because he's on his way to more pessimism. But the jellies join him in sand snuggling because they can't remember a life before Dee Dee. Sharks are your friends. Um, our wanted to remind you of our reading next month here at Soul Food, um, whatever the date is, third Thursday of the month. Uh, our for National Poetry Month, uh, our two readers uh, are going to be Kevin Kraft and Carrie Wason. And if you uh, are unfamiliar with, with Kevin, he is the editor of Poetry Northwest magazine, which is one of the oldest uh, poetry magazines uh, in this in the country, uh, certainly in this part of the country, and. Um, uh, Carrie, well, you can read about her on the website. Please go to the, the look for Soul Food Poetry Night, and you can read about uh, both of them. Um, so please come for that. Our next reader is Michael McGee, and his favorite childhood toy is a panda bear. Michael. Sawway Miserable met for the first time in October, and since then I've been looking, viewing the video, and uh, watching Colm Williamson in the original, and then Alfie Bow playing John Rathbone in the one, uh, 25th anniversary. So it's really gotten me in my bloodstream. Um, this is called My Name is Jean Valjean. I am an old man who stole a loaf of bread. And with two candlesticks, I forged my chains. I lived my life to repay what I took that day. The heart of a thief is locked inside my rib cage. I learned to make my fate with hands that bled. I lifted up that boy to carry him from the barricades, fathered him until he chose my only child 
until death. I whittled away the year like a file in increments. What links one man to another, a kind of hunger, a kind of pain? Tied me to Jobert, a hunted man I'd never see, until he meets his master face to face. I confess my sins to him. My name is Jean Valjean, I said, and walked away. Uh, the second poem, um, recently I, I saw a little article in the New York Times, and there in front of it was the photograph of uh, the home of the Beatles, two of the Beatles in Liverpool. And when I went to Liverpool, I went to look at those things and went to those homes. And the area that Paul McCartney and John Lennon li uh, lived in, uh, they actually called Mendish, was the name of it. So recently, the National Heritage has celebrated with giving those two homes a grade C listing. So I kind of imagined if I was a estate agent, maybe what I would say. Toodaloo, you can live in this semi-detached up and down with a two-seat parlor too. Just a hop, a skip, and a jump rope from Penny Lane where the fire engine comes out in the pouring rain. 251 Men Love Avenue. So do women love their men. Here John Lennon lived with his uncle and aunt after Julia stepped out one day and never, never came back. Very sad. How very strange to see it now under blue suburban skies just around the corner from where the McCartleys lived at 20 Forthian Road and they tuned their guitars to play in Razzle Band in Liverpool, the tavern. Come back to where the barber shaves another customer. You'll be invited in for tea and Eccles cakes and sausage rolls will make strange bedfellows. Strawberry fields will bloom forever. Thank you. We have Tim Courtney, whose favorite childhood toy was my horse, or his horse, I suppose. I just have to make a poem for him. All right. In the meantime, Shauna Fisher and Yo-Yo, you can get on the list. How about that? <laughs> Shauna Fisher and your Yo-Yo. My stuff doesn't really rhyme like everybody else's stuff. I guess it's because, so anyway, this one doesn't really have a title. So here it goes. Inspiration, more awakened, bombs of humans inspired. I'm open but hidden to some and embrace whatever level those are at that don't understand. I walk my truth and my truth alone. The power inside myself unlocked is the key. As animals, don't hide their truth. Don't hide behind their truth. They are always in their truth, and live in the light of live in the light and love and knowingness. That's it's kind of a book I'm working on, like about animals and spirituality. So I don't know. That's something. And then this other poem. Um, sometimes we just have to. It's called the flow of time. Sometimes we just have to ride with the flow of energy, ride the tide, so to speak. To where the journey unfolds, sometimes it takes time for us to see it clear. Flowing with the energy just seems where seeing when it takes us to the next phase of consciousness and awareness of that in which our next step on the journey is to be seen. Flowing, flowing, flowing about beyond, beyond the shades of shore, the shores of shores where our dreams begin and we beckon onto a new chapter of self-discovery and accomplishment as we follow through and finally sit back and listen and trust in the, gr in the grandest of the flow 
and ah, and the grandest flow of the universe and its tides of wisdom for us to share the flow of time. Sorry, I wrote that really quick. <laughs> I couldn't hear it. So. Okay, thank you. Next, we have Emma Petersky and her favorite childhood toy of Star Trek models. fantasized about encountering my historical figure naked in the woods, putting my feet around them and showing them how television works. This subject has sometimes been Metna, Thomas Jefferson, even Jesus. This is one of the things uh, that I imagine to keep my head down in class and guide me to believe that I have a chance of being something greater than I am. I've been well aware, to, aware of this next theory, and I find that society doesn't have much patience for this sort of thinking. Pure senses is my only escape. The only way in which I can capture a glimpse of the soul of another person is by feeling something that they have created. And taking the brush strokes and colors I get back from them as waves, they sift on and I see the sea behind me. And it's this, the sensation that each individual audience member created in the past and is being born again in this moment. This breaks the ultimate burden of consciousness that as we know it, no one is capable of making or having the same thoughts as another person. I am proposing that the argument be accepted. Logically, something chemical that creates a neuron to neuron exchange is already occurring. Yeah. But illogically, we could dance on puny clouds and drink champagne to the fact. We could stretch and twirl into splatters of red wine on a polka dot press and shake the hands of those we love. But I digress. It's probably the consequence of my own hyperventilating need to see or adapt to my soul while sitting in class. However, I don't hope for glimpses of my soul. I hope that they be patient with my awkward weirdness and take into account that I'm trying my best not to specifically write for you. Or perhaps I'm writing for you because you are the faces of freedom. And sometimes it's hard to catch you when you are running so fast. In any case, I'm glad that I have the chance to shake your cool hand and pull up a chair for you today. Your cool hand is leaving me in pondering at the face of you. I suppose you'll be another failed attempt, unless you'd like to be a lost one. We could always roam prehistoric hills in the warm sun until our social shock stand of agreement. Why not be patient soft and still to refresh and water and bore all the heads of the discussion of the day? We could forget everything and just be us, not a girl or a girl or some other conjured illusion of human. You can be everything and nothing as the wind soars through the grass and the green field of maple. You will never have to feel guilt that you are not. We can just slide over the smooth water and be a professional dive smoldering ahead of us until the cracks and tumble of the historic past. Oh, how can we laugh and fly and reach our arms up and pull the willow leaves? And perhaps a bird will build its nest on our branches and it will laugh and fly as we do. We could laugh until birds fly from our mouths, plunging and soaring above our heads. There will be every color of the songs of our ancestors. They will not destroy us or control or capture it. They are as they are because words could not create art that we could ever understand. This is perhaps the truly true disconnect between humans and other species that we share with the planet below. We can only share our art with one another. Do you like music? Music that doubles into your chest and rises from your lungs into a silent moan that you're glad no one else can hear. Perhaps we can break this silence together. We could fly into each other than flutter or circle than steer. I hope I'm not being too bold. I'm not used to being loved by someone that I love. This is very daunting for me. I'll try my best. We'll see. We weren't just a handful. We'd have staring contests with the magazines. And this is no 
more than what it can reveal itself when there are scars for the truth and conscience in the fight. With we will never see the brainwashed people that in which we blend the veins together and into the milk that we mix into the bowl of flour that will yield every shade of margarine and pour down the turning metal we slip into this bog like carbon dating, ramshackling the art of selling happiness. Until we blend our souls with the ice of ignorance, toppling our blister, and lamenting coming back, growing moonshine that tastes of the desert air. For we will never, we promise to never, let it melt into our blood. Because you are only as perfect as it could ever get from the start. For all I know, you are true. And even if you weren't, I would still be enamored to hear about how people that you chose to have killed but you chose to probably have given trouble getting killed, or perhaps the people don't even exist in this valley. You have said something else that confuses me so much. He laughed. Your hand is so cruel, and it's not that hard to throw a head back and leave it here. You saw him, you saw how cruel he was, cuddling and sticking stones that with every blow of fire in him, his heart was weary and hurt, frustrating the soothing glance of thoughts from the underworld. Oh, he lit up and turned red. Next, we have David Simmons, who did not list a favorite childhood toy, so hopefully he will give us one. I will not give you my favorite childhood toy, because I don't, uh, my parents don't live that close, and I don't know if I could find it in their garage. But um, I was trying to think. My favorite childhood toy, like way back when, was a blanket, like when I was three years old. And I think I probably threw out mine over something that never became something else. Oh, and a green frog. It was a green frog that I really liked, and it got lost by the time I was like eight and was ancient history and never came back. Um, I have some legitimate poems, what I would consider my legitimate poems, and then I have like some random crap from like extended poems and like fragments of stuff that I had typed up and printed for some odd reason so I could work on them. I'll read you, read you a legitimate poem, sort of, um, that's still in progress, called The Little Store. I said it was called The Little Store, a poem for those with courage, and it's a autobiographical poem. Um, so, The Little Store. Consolidating my well-saved coins like candy in one pocket, I started toward the store knowing well that the thin-haired man, owner of every chocolate I knew of in the world, but who had clearly never eaten one himself, would glare at me, never print your poems in like thin green, like a light green color. <laughs> okay, uh, he, uh, knowing that he would glare at me with the um, the aspect of a judge before a lifetime thief. Uh, he would look at me with disdain. I'm summarizing. Uh, he would look at me with the seriousness of an undertaker regarding a corpse and the profile of a statue known as a shrave. I messed that up. Hands folded in, perched on a stool, he would frown audibly as I brought each piece to my inadequate eyes, stalling a decision until I had seen each one up close. Furled brows would follow me with merciless suspicion as I gathered my sugars color by color. He'd clear his throat of cobwebs as I neared the chin-high counter and placed my meager, meager spoils there. I finally had so resigned he would accept my nickels morbidly like confessions that arrive in years of sorrow. This is not a theory, it is a hypothesis. For those of you who really cannot, it's like 
um, tends to try and like move them on a little bit. Um, theory has to be more well established. When two people see the same beautiful thing, they always see something different, and they always know something different, and they have always found something different. But I have thought that what they feel is exactly what the other person feels. Last but not least, uh, this is a work in progress. It's composed mostly of images and not so, not so much like a full poem, but it's about Jet City Espresso in Renton, and it closed today, and I was sad because I went there once in my life, and it was really interesting. It's the background is good. It's a really messy place, and it's supposed to be a messy place. That's the that's the vibe. Rest in peace, Jet City Espresso of Renton. May you have enough space for a filthy living room in heaven with old white ghetto sofas piled to the ceiling with astronaut magazines, dusty clocks with tired faces, dilapidated lamps sprouting from the mess with one word brilliant, coffee steaming in the hands of nostalgic sons of painters, faded landscapes covered with broken plastic, bicycles locked against the weeds with outdoor gas tanks. May there be enough room for your disorganizations in heaven and a seat for a beggar, and a door for the cold and its memory ghost. Rest in peace, your low neighborhood, and your coffee so good that it wakes the dead. May there be a corner in heaven for the junk, for your junk, for your furniture, for your puzzles and conversations, your newspapers and rusted iron tables, eight-track players and tattered bar stools. And as we walk the column through the center of your curios or through a forest or an animal graveyard, may someone measure your precision, honor the place that you made for forgotten things and the names you gave to everything that does not disappear. Is there anyone who has not signed up who would like to read? This is a poem of mine, it's called Bus Stop, it's a recent poem. The umbrella in the umbrella urn by the cafe door nods at her with its plastic handle, its collapsed canopy plunged into darkness as if six feet under. She imagines the umbrella's bright color and the color of its owner at the table she had, his chalk teeth cracking biscotti the color of dirt, the dust of its undoing slanting like the rain that soaks her now at the bus stop until that dust comes to rest on the dust of the tabletop to be wiped away with dripped coffee, neglected dreams, and that one loose flake of ash from the urn she carries. She imagines this with the faintest shudder and pulls me closer in the endless rain. Next, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Tanya McDonald is going to read and her favorite, oh, I forgot to tell you mine. Um, I have to say Lego, no one else wrote down Lego. Oh wait. Herb, Herb's up to read too. Okay, Herb's next. Okay, um, Lego, and I also had a chess set that I loved. I loved when I was a child. So, so Herb McLeese is our next reader, and his favorite childhood toy is sitting on the table. Chemistry set. <laughs> Evil laugh. Chemistry set. Herb McLeese. And my second favorite was probably a shortwave radio that I'd spent endless hours listening to all over the world. That was the internet of those days, if you will. <laughs> this uh, first one I didn't intend to read, but after hearing um, some of the themes that, that have already come up this evening, I thought I needed to read it tonight. It's a recent one. It's called Ancient Clock. In my dream, I was a bird 
in a flock, suspended between earth and sky, with strong wings beating in synchrony and compass, migration toy. We were the living works of an ancient clock, its pendulum, our swing fall swings, its chimes, a far off thunderclap echoing, echoing, my flock, and falling, falling in tighter circles, powerless to call back the gunshot from the hunter's blind. This is a, t a pen's dream. My pen can dream. Reveries in uncertain memory, flotsam thoughts that toss on an image sea, freed from their retail packaging. But to be real, to remain, the pen must dream on the page while being lightly held and thought unwound from its silken cocoon without breaking its gossamer strand. This precious strand is spun into lines of inky words and a wondrous fabric made only then by sewing and cutting can we fashion and bring to life the stuff of dreams. Absent a spinner's gentle hand or a tailor's steady grip, an eager pen held carelessly can become a rapier and by thrusting this way and that, rend the liminal matrix that separates writer from whirling darkness. As for me, I prefer writing shorter verse, less chance for my wounded pen to bleed its words or worse, pierce the page and open windows that cannot be easily closed. <laughs> All righty, we're getting a few last minute is additions to the uh, to the list here. So if you still do want to read, this will be your last chance. So uh, put your put your name down soon. Uh, up next, apparently, is me, um, and I put down that my favorite childhood toy was Smurfs. I just picked one of many, the little blue ones that I played with in the bathtub with my sisters, and still have all of them at home, cluttering a drawer somewhere. Leap day. This is not a haiku. Leap day. It's a clever thing, the common cold, which we carry in our bodies for three days, like unattended luggage or un... Let's start over, because I know we're recording this. Leap day. This is why I read haiku usually. It's a clever thing, the common cold, which we carry in our bodies, like unattended luggage, for three days before we're even aware we've got it all the while passing it along like invisible fruitcake to unsuspecting strangers. Except I like fruitcake. Honestly, I do. Parti particularly for its flavor, but also for its malign status. Oh, fruitcake, you underdog dessert that mails well. You cornucopia of mystery fruits that glow in the backs of cupboards. Fresco of flavors. The gift that keeps on giving giving like a handshake at a party where you don't know anyone other than the person you came with. And names come flying at you. Brian, Anna, Chrissy, another Brian, Lloyd or Floyd or Lloyd. And you're supposed to catch them in your pocket, paired with, each of, paired with what each of them do. It's important what we do. <laughs> but when the conversational ball bounces back to you, what can you say? You don't work at Microsoft or Amazon, or Google. <laughs> you don't have kids. Hell, you don't even drink coffee, or by all appearances, al alcohol, since you're driving tonight. 
you do, do you contest the truth? Which will predictably earn you the follow-up question of, well, really? Where have you been published? Or do you invent a more socially acceptable reply? Or do you simply announce that you love fruitcake, announce it loud to the room, and sing its praises until everyone keeps their distance? And you no longer have to worry about who is carrying that fugitive virus under their tongue. <laughs> next time I'll untangle my tongue first. And up next we have Abby Peggy. Peggy. Woohoo! Thank you for the handwriting, it helps. Whose favorite childhood toy was, and I must agree with you on this, computer paper. And is this your first this isn't your first time, is it? Is you woohoo! First time. I don't even normally read my poetry, but like whenever my friends want to read it, I just hand them the book and make them read it. And I've only ever actually like recited it once, so <laughs> it's going to be intense. Um, this is one from about an hour ago, maybe more like two hours now, and I haven't edited it yet, so bear with me. It's called Drinking. You drank up all the life, and now there's none left. You drank up all the death. Now it consumes your mind. You drank up all the wine, and now you can't stop laughing. You drank all of the juice, and now you can't stop crying. You drank all your words, now they can't get out. You drank the car, now it's carrying you out. You drank the highway, now the car is climbing it. You want to drink the exit sign, will you? Oh, that one's really depressing. <laughs> Here is a happier one from about a week or so ago. This is the only one I've ever recited. Okay. To the child who draws dead unicorns as a, mean of es as a means of escape, I love you. To the boy who stayed up all night smoking his birthday cake, I love you. To the minister who preached his faithless heart out so that others might have faith, I love you. To the politician whose opinion was invalidated by the truth, I love you. To the young man who let people fear him so that they might fear others less, I love you. To the fat woman stuffing her face because she's so afraid of being empty, I love you. To the skinny one wasting away because invisibility is the closest that she can get to freedom, I love you. To the silent but strong boy who wishes that he wasn't afraid to cry, I love you. To the ever smooth rock that ripples the sea, I love you. To the ashes of last night's adventure, I love you. To the unsung song and the painting unseen, even by the artist who painted it, I love you. To the insult that quibbles freshly in between my shaded rays, I love you. To the love, I love you. To the fear, I love you. Because everything is holy. Thank you. Thank you, and please, please come back. Next, we have Derek Radcliffe, whose favorite childhood toy was uh, a Game Boy, which they didn't uh, even have when I was a kid. Is this your first time here, too? Yeah. Welcome, Derek. <laughs> yes, this is my first time here. I was not planning to be here. I just got out of a uh, Spring Awakening rehearsal. So, and we had dance today, so I'm like really tired. And so if I'm shaking, it's not just because of the bass fight. It's also because we had to learn two eighth counts that goes ba, 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 ba. And I'm like, uh, so, <laughs> and I don't have, I didn't think I had any poetry today, so I have to cover the bills on my own. And I did, I did poetry twice, right? So I said, uh, open mic, my dad brought me to open mic a couple times. And where is it? Oh, here's my poem. This one is called, I'm Too Heavy. I'm about to break this gate. This place cannot pull me up. This space cannot keep me above ground. I'm destined to never leave the earth's fateful mound. I am gonna tell you about the chains weighing me down. I must look like a liar because I say I'm really heavy. But seriously, well first I bear my cross religiously. Carried over my shoulders, I may show it with pride for the prejudice. I hold with open hands, not with fists. 
is the price I pay for the life I bear, shutting up the world who tells my friends to cut their wrists and telling me not to care. Second, my heart is open to all positivity. It's twice the normal size to love the crazy and the normal, then twice the abnormal size to love the broken and the hopeful. There's only just enough room in this shell, and that's because my heart's been broken enough times to finally fit each of the pieces so well. Third, I see the word, I see the world technically. I see you broken down into cause and reaction. From the look on your face to every sur- simple motion, the question to notion is why would this be a problem? But you can't unsee what you've already seen. You can't unknow what you already know. I like to forget so I, c- so I can remember what it is like to take chances again. The weight of knowledge makes me stuck, for I can see far down the roads not traveled, but I can't find the one that doesn't let a relationship unravel. So I just stand still. Fourth and last, my stomach that's always empty. Now, sure, I'm in college, so it is my time to eat, feast off of learning and growing and understanding, but I seem to keep feeding myself on my poor emotions. I push them down my throat and keep having full portions, two servings of sadness, one serving of happiness with a side of grief sprinkled with denial and a tall glass of forgiveness. There's one thing good that can fill my stomach to the brim, the butterflies from stage fright that always find a way to settle in. For every time I take a step on stage, they're there in the pit. They take up any room of emotion, and I have to spill all of mine out. Where I pour it into my acting, directing, or reading of my poem, they're the reason I must come back, face the audience, and show them what my life's all about. So don't worry that I'm heavy. You live and you learn to cope. All I know is that it's worth it to spread a little hope. Thank you. Okay, last call. Anybody else? No? All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for braving the torrential weather we've had today. Thank you for our two our two readers for traveling up and down um, to get here. We very much appreciate you. And please come back next month, third Thursday, where you're here all the time. Thank you. And thank you to Soul Food, these fabulous people, for having us and putting up with us. Good night, everybody.
to the love we love.